There we go. So, um, welcome everyone to tonight's uh, Ask the Experts. It's the first Ask the Experts of the year, and it's really exciting that we're opening it up this year to a talk about wellness and mindfulness. Um, I'm not sure about the rest of the group, but I feel like a breath of um, relief has come out um, knowing that we're going to talk about these things, especially with everything that's you know happened over the last few weeks and even year it's just nice that you know by the end of tonight we might have a fresh perspective on how we look after ourselves not just in the physical sense but how we look after our minds and how that connects to our bodies as well and the way that we we act and conduct ourselves as well so um i'm going to ask john to introduce tonight for us uh, over to john Thanks, Melissa. Um, well, I'm delighted uh, tonight and welcome everybody. Firstly, it's lovely to see so many people here. Um, you know, we've got staff, we've got parents, we've got pupils, OWs. Fantastic to see so many people. And this is what we're going to try and do so much of during this, uh, this latest lockdown period. You know, uh, I think you're probably aware that my passion is about keeping our whole community together. And I'm delighted tonight that we've got Aaron Corley with us. Uh, Aaron is an old worksopian, uh, I'm delighted to say. He was in Portland House um, when Portland House was an all through house from year nine to year 13. So he was here at uh, Workshop College from 2010 to 2015. Uh, he was a member uh, proudly of the first 15 rugby team. And he left the college uh, with very, very good results and went on to gain a degree in neuroscience. And I suppose hence his, uh, his interest in, uh, in everything uh, to do with the mind subsequently. Uh, I'm delighted to say that Aaron uh, returned and rejoined the college this year. Uh, and those uh, pupils in Pelham House will know him particularly well because he is currently an assistant housemaster in Pelham House, uh, Boys House. Uh, and he's been assisting obviously with rugby coaching uh, and also conducting some mindfulness sessions with the pupils and obviously some and also some yoga sessions as well uh, so we we've had his expertise uh, throughout the last term which we're, we're delighted about and obviously it's ongoing so I mean really as Melissa says it's a really difficult time for everybody uh, and, and more than anything um, you know I as the head of the college here uh, recognize the importance of well-being for everybody uh, and that's you know staff uh, pupils the parents uh, everybody who is involved, OWs, with the whole workshop community. Uh, and it's vitally important that we always pride ourselves on the fact that we are a family. And it's at times like this that families come together and support one another. So hence this particular event tonight. So I'm delighted actually that this talk is actually the forerunner uh, to a weekly series on well-being that Aaron will be putting together, I'm delighted to say for us. And that will involve videos that will be available to pupils, staff, OWs and to parents. So without further ado, I am going to hand over to uh, Aaron uh, and Melissa who will conduct the rest of the session. Please enjoy it. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Take care and stay safe. Thank you. Aaron. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. That was lovely. Um, so yeah, Aaron, let's find out a little bit more about you. Um, how did this all start for you? How, um, what is your background and how did you discover um, mindfulness? Um, well, first of all, I want to mention that I'm struggling to accept the title uh, expert, but I, I definitely have a, a deep passion for this topic. Um, after school, uh, I went traveling around for a, a couple of years working abroad in uh, many different professions. I was a chalet host, I worked as a laborer in, in Australia. I, worked as a teacher support, um, a support teacher in rural Fiji. And uh, I just sort of met a lot of people and, um, and had a really good time. But one of the, the major impacts that that had on me was actually a, a physical injury. On my ski season, I, I ruptured a, a ligament in my knee. And all throughout my school career and all throughout uh, my life, really, I'd had this huge physical outlet, being able to express my passion through physicality, physicality. and uh, this was sort of ripped away from me. And um, what this resulted in was um, this passion and this energy that, that I had started to be misdirected a bit and I started to actually send it in some quite unwholesome, self-destructive behaviours and habits. Some of them very uh, low-key um, and some of them a little bit more severe. Um, 
But then when I went to university, uh, I had my operation. And after about four months, uh, a friend invited me to go to a yoga class. And I was just raring to get back to rugby. I was just raring to get back strong, get back fit. And um, I walked in that yoga class and I walked out two different men. I, uh, it was around sort of exam season and, um, and deadlines. And I was gobsmacked by how focusing my attention on my body and my breath had changed my experience so drastically of the world. And I was about five months in at this point, my first year of studying neuroscience. So starting to build a conceptual knowledge of how our brain drives our behaviors, our habits, our desires, uh, all these things which are drivers throughout the day. And I was just like, wow, I can, I can affect the way that I experience this world through these practices that people have known apparently for thousands of years. And um, I knew there was something in it. In the early days, I just knew there was something in it. Throughout my degree, <clears throat> I sort of went down two avenues. I, I was very passionate about my degree. I was very hot on researching it. But then at the same time, um, I found a very good um, meditation teacher, a, a Buddhist nun called Sister Jin Ho, who's ordained in the Mahayana tradition of Buddhism. And I've been practicing with her for three years now. And um, I also found a very good yoga teacher. So I was sort of going down this esoteric route and studying neuroscience. And in my final year of university, I decided to conduct a study to see if breathing exercises could change the way that the human nervous system reacts to psychological stress. So I designed and conducted a study with students and led them through a breathing work exercise and measured their nervous system uh, to see if they got less stressed if they'd done the breathing exercise um, because it's very common within students to have panic attacks and to to get overstressed which actually affects their performance in exams um, and I want you know a bit a bit of stress is good and I want people to be able to have that tool to find their their sweet spot and the it was very successful uh, the, the the graphs were sort of like this like the breathing exercise has, has a huge physical um uh physical effect and this is all sort of what it's uh my journey sort of in terms of what i've done but then also just my own personal experience of being my own guinea pig i've completely changed my experience of the world i uh i'm much less harsh to myself in my own head i am more stable i am i think a better listener i'm more able to be in the present moment and um I attribute it to these practices. Obviously, some of it is to do with maturing, but um, I'm very passionate about these exercises because I believe they have changed my life for the better. That's amazing. It's 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 so really like good to hear as well that a lot of it is kind of supplemented through knowledge that you've acquired as well over time. That you know you can you can do these types of things and you you're almost completely taken by the experience but it sounds like there's a real level-headed approach to it as well in the sense that you know you've had underlying knowledge there as well like from your degree and and things like that so would you say that those types of things guided why you now talk about why people should practice mindfulness yeah, I mean, it's starting to become quite common knowledge in, in uh, well, common knowledge. It's, it's starting to be very heavily backed by scientific research that um, mindfulness is, is an incredibly useful and efficacious tool to in increasing our state of well-being and then increasing performance and um, helping people strive to be their best. There's a study done by Harvard University by Matthew Killingsworth and uh, Daniel Gilbert, where they basically text, they texted um, their subjects throughout the day. And they basically wanted to find out where their thoughts were in comparison to what they were actually doing. 
And uh, the results are quite staggering that um, in this study group, 47% of the time, on average, people were thinking about something else that they weren't doing. So the thoughts were on other things, not on what they were doing, 47%. And um, other research is starting to show that the amount of time that you spend wandering in your mind is proportional to your state of well-being. That it is one of the best predictors of your well-being is the amount of time that you spend in wandering thought. And I could go into why that is perhaps later, but um, mindfulness is the skill of sort of gaining back a little bit of um, control of the mind to come to the present moment uh, and not be lost in, in these thoughts which um, actually quite often are, are quite toxic for our well-being and our self-esteem. Okay. So from, from that, my understanding would be that mindfulness is, is almost an umbrella of, of how you almost look after yourself in that sense. And there are practices um, that you do in order to, to achieve, would you say achieve mindfulness or be proactive in mindfulness what's the right terminology for that terminology i'm not sure on the correct terminology but i would just usually say what proportion of your day are you being mindful and what proportion of your day are you uh floating in thought and uh in at the end of the day thought is often very far from reality it's often ruminating over something which has occurred in the past or imagining something which is in the future and uh, memory isn't always the best um, resource and imagination definitely isn't hard evidence so it's sort of what proportion of your day are you spending with reality uh, yeah that's really interesting I don't know if anybody else in in the talk kind of does that but when I was studying sports at college, they, they taught us about mental preparation and how athletes understand anxiety um, and use that as a tool to almost guide themselves and prepare for what's about to happen. But that almost sounds like that is mindful wandering in this sense, um, which is, is that different? Am I thinking differently there? Yeah, so the future and the past aren't inherently low value they are low value when it is done passively goal setting and visualization is a very high value way to spend time in in the future with the mind just like reflection uh, is a very high value way to spend time in the past but this is structured this is with a with a method what is what is very low value is drifting into either of these states. And the reason why it's so low value is, not only because it's a waste of time often, is because of our cognitive biases. Our mind did not evolve to make us happy. Our, our mind evolved to keep us alive so that we can reproduce. And since we now live in a very different state to the one that we evolved in, a lot of these biases that our mind has actually really affect our uh, our well-being. I mean, just uh, to cover one of them, that, I mean, there's 12 well-established cognitive biases. I'll just do one now. Negativity bias. So um, our mind is heavily biased towards putting more weight on our decision-making on negative thoughts in comparison to positive thoughts. So if you think about in evolution, it's very beneficial to put a heavier weight on a negative thought in comparison to a positive thought. If you're going around a corner and the thought arises, there might be a tiger there. The consequences of not trusting that thought are very high. You might die, but the consequences of, uh, with the positive side are much lower. So, but the problem is now, bias towards placing so much more importance on I'm not going to get the job in comparison to I will. So this is just one example as to why passively wandering the mind is not good and um, it's beneficial to develop the skill of managing this passive wandering.
That's really interesting. Thanks, Aaron. It's certainly it's certainly food for thought when you think about it. Because I know personally, I'm a little guilty of that. I don't know if anyone else listening is um, or has experience of that. I wouldn't, maybe guilty is not the right word. Maybe that's a, a part of it as well. But um, Think, thinking about it and you know some of the ideas behind it would you say that there are you know common misconceptions around what mindfulness is and how people experience it yeah i think um mindfulness has become a, a bit of a buzzword and really just to strip it down to its foundations mindfulness is being aware of something or being present with something and so being mindful is being mindful of your being what is your experience of the world right now in in its entirety and one of the main misconceptions that i think people have is um that um i think too much to be mindful i think that's a really common one especially people who are trying to meditate i think too much um, this is one of the first difficult, perhaps difficult hurdle that people might face with their journey with mindfulness is um, realizing that it's the mindfulness of the thought is the practice. And I think a lot of people have uh, this sort of image with a state of bliss and, and total emptiness of mind as, as the goal of mindfulness. But um, I guess it is eventually. Uh, but the the goal of mindfulness is actually to practice it, not to achieve mindfulness, I think is the main thing. Mindfulness is a practice rather than necessarily a state. Um, and so being mindful of the thoughts arising and falling rather than um, aiming to find a state of clarity and flow, I think is the main misconception that I think people often hold. So potentially being able to recognise, if we use, you know, panic attacks, for example, being able to recognise the symptoms of a panic attack is part of the solution of dealing with panic attacks, you could almost say. So for mindfulness, would you say that that is a, a common thing for that as well, is to, is to recognise the signs of, you know, when your mind's wandering or it's going down a negative place, is, is rather than allowing it and then almost like letting yourself fall to then pick yourself back up again it's catching it just as you're about here and going okay i recognize this and i'm going to do something about it exactly exactly and when mindfulness is coupled um with tools to manage the nervous system such as breathwork techniques or um visualization or there's many different tools to manage the nervous system. Um, for example, let's use panic attacks. Um, this is something that I know quite well because a lot of my research was to do with it. Um, often a panic attack is caused, be, um, the, the first one is often a phenomena. It's often uh, hard to describe why the first panic attack will happen, but the reason why people will have them often is because the first panic attack is so traumatizing that the physical sensations of panic become panicking and traumatizing and therefore it becomes a positive feedback loop where the mind uh, notices the symptoms which then cause the mind to cause more symptoms and this positive feedback loop occurs so mindfulness of body and of thought will allow you to notice those things arising quicker and then intervene with one of your tools to manage the nervous system, to calm racing thoughts and to come back to the present moment and widen the perspective into I'm actually safe right now and to feel it and live that aspect of safety. So mindful of tools powerful. Lovely. So are there, are there any ways that we can practice mindfulness, um, you know, with some of the things that we've discussed already? 
yeah, so um, I'll share what my main practice is, uh, which is mindfulness of body. And um, a little bit of background behind this works in terms of neuroscience is, um, well, and psychology. The mind has the capacity to spend time in the future and the past. Um, and these are often where a lot of problems, a lot of stressing stimuli reside. Whereas my hand, the sensations of my hand can only be transmitted from the present moment. My, the receptors in my skin do not function in a way which allow me to think about abstract ideas such as past and future. So if my attention is on my physical sensations, this is an anchor to the present moment. So if you practice um, mindfulness of physical sensations, two things will happen. Firstly, um, you will become um, familiar with the physical sensations within your body and you will gain a greater capacity to um, move your attention into the body and out of the mind. So you will gain the, a better capacity to do that first. And then second of all, with regular practice, it will become your habit to spend more time with your attention on your body and therefore habitually live in, a, in more presence. Um, and this works in terms of neuroscience because there's a, you'll always hear neuroscientists say this, neurons that fire together, wire together. So for those of you who aren't, uh, um, who haven't done any sort of neurophysiology, very simple, is that the way that neurons speak to each other is that they have a synapse. And when this neuron, neural connection is new, the synapse is sort of like small like this. It's, it's, it's like a cup uh, like this, and they sort of send chemicals between them to chat. When it's new, the, the, the attachment is quite small. But as these uh, neurons start firing together, and, and they fire and fire and fire, this connection grows and becomes stronger, meaning that when you get loads of these neurons in a, in a network, the, the stronger these connections, the stronger that network is. And so this is how habits form. Uh, you get up, brush your teeth, get up, brush your teeth. So the network, which is involved with get up, brush your teeth, brush your teeth. And then eventually it's just automatic. You get up and you brush your teeth. This is how behavior is formed. Neuroplasticity, learning. Um, but on the other side of things, if this is a really strong network and you just stop using it, or it doesn't get any positive or negative feedback, the synapse starts to do this and eventually the network will weaken. So by getting lost in thought, oh, I'm thinking, come back to attention to the body, or oh, get distracted again, come back to the body, you're strengthening the neural networks to send your attention to your body, and you're weakening the networks which are automatically sending your attention to thought. And so you, are, you, you can see this on brain scans and experienced meditators. Actually, there's a study that shows that on an MRI, you can see the physiological changes after eight weeks of meditation. Um, you are changing the physiology of your brain through your mind with practices like these. Um, and I could lead a short one now to... Yeah, that would be amazing if, you, if you'd like to do that. Okay. So uh, if all of you could please um, sit up a little bit so that your spine is nice and straight. If you're on the back of your chair, please just come off the back of your chair so your spine is sort of sitting on your pelvis. Um, touch in slightly, and quite importantly, make sure you're on your and make sure your the soles of your feet are flat on the floor so it's a bit more grounded. Everyone, raise your hands up like so. I want you to clap quite hard three times. And then let your hands fall down to rest on your knees and close your eyes. 
and just tune into that tingling feeling in your hands. Feel the physical sensation. Now try and send your attention specifically to your thumbs. Moving your attention up to your forearms. Try and see if you can feel what the texture of your clothing or the temperature of the room on your skin is like. Moving up to the elbows. and the upper arms. Now sending your attention to your neck and your shoulders, just raising your shoulders up and scrunching them up to meet your ears and breathe in. And on the exhale, let your shoulders relax and your shoulder blades roll down your back. See if you can relax your shoulders further. So feeling your entirety of your arms all the way from your fingertips up to your shoulders. Now moving up to the head, trying to tune into the feeling of the skin on your scalp. What does it feel like? I'm gonna ask you a question. How do you know you have a forehead without looking? Trying to relax the space between your eyebrows. Let your eyes relax in their sockets. And let your tongue and your jaw hang loose and relaxed. Paying attention to your nostrils, inhaling, Fill the belly and notice the feeling of the air coming through your nostrils and into your lungs. Hold that breath at the top for one, two, three, and sigh it out like you're trying to fog up a window. <sighs> one more like that. Breathe in, feel the air come in. And then let the air fall out. Just notice how you feel the entirety of your body. Rocking your body from side to side, just creating some gentle movement. And when you're ready, just open your eyes a quarter. So not all the way, just let some air, 
sorry, let's enlighten first. Bring yourself back into the room a bit. And when you feel ready, open your eyes. That was amazing. Thank you for sharing that with us, Aaron. Um, how do people feel after that? If uh, if anyone feels uh, comfortable speaking. I feel brilliant, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> really good. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> so do I. I. I certainly needed it, Aaron. That was great. Yeah, thank you. Brilliant. Yeah, that was really lovely. Thank you. Um, so we, we have time now for um, people to ask Aaron any questions. Um, if they would like advice on how to practice mindfulness in their day to day, um, feel free to uh, either pop them in the chat or unmute and ask your questions now. There we go, we've got one from Mark. Um, if your brain is wired differently and therefore you cannot deal with the situation that is happening around you, how can the person use mindfulness to change or develop their synapses? So, my what comes up when uh with this question is um if your brain is wired differently um brains are incredibly plastic which means that they adapt to we, we are the only species which has been proven to have the ability to uh change the architecture of our our neurons into adulthood so if someone is faced with a uh, challenging situation and they cannot deal with it, I'm assuming that means that they can't meet the demands or they have an emotional episode or something. Um, that is because the, it is either novel to them, which means that they don't have um, a, a, a system or a method with being able to um, uh, if the synapses, if a brain is wired differently. If a situation is novel, most people will find that stressing. That is, that is a, uh, uh, quite unanimous. But what is different is people have uh, different uh, states of sh shock or uh, arousal in situations. And so it's really all habit and strong and weak network. So if someone is wired differently, you can't really compare someone. They will just have a network which is strengthened to do with fight or flight response. They will have a network which is strong to react in an emotional and perhaps a not a conducive way to success or dealing with the situation. And the way that that can happen is it's hard to do in the moment if you haven't been practicing mindfulness before to develop awareness of your of your uh, behavior so how can a person use mindfulness is that they can go away from that situation where they uh, didn't deal with a situation and develop mindfulness of their emotions and their mind and then perhaps um, wait for a situation to arise again where they will be able to have more distance between their emotions and thoughts and then be less reactive less time and be able to use their rational mind to respond in a, a more wise and conscious way in a less compulsive manner. So um, a few simple techniques to use at the start of each lesson. Um, well, 
the best way to well one of the simplest ways um well what's the goal the goal is to increase the presence focus and calm i'm guessing in the students so um i think box breathing is an amazingly simple and well-known technique so some of the pupils might already know it where um you basically get the students to visualize a box and along the top of the box you would inhale for five seconds hold it for five seconds exhale for five seconds and then hold at the bottom of the exhale for five seconds and do this for a few minutes and what this does is it because you're sending your attention to your breath which is a physical sensation you're starting to move the the attention into the body in a um in a slow rhythmic pattern which has been proved to just calm the mind calm the nervous system reduce agitation and i think it really increases a, a conducive state for learning and listening Aaron, how many times would you do that? Um, two minutes has been shown to have um, a very profound effect on interrupting thought patterns. Um, okay. Two minutes is a number that has been shown uh, as, an, as an interruption. You know, like if, if they're in a state of like agitation, you want to interrupt the momentum of that. And two minutes is sort of a number which has been used. But you could almost judge it on the day, like if they come in and they just seem to be just these bunch of Zen monks just ready to just learn, then maybe you need to for a little bit. <laughs> but if they come in and they're like particularly riled, then you can go for a little bit longer. But probably experience of leading it yourself would you'll gain experience and a, and a feel for it and the atmosphere before and after. I was going to say, would you, would you count the box for them? So would you count the five and count the five? And, and so, you know, so I'm just thinking with younger ones, I'd probably get a million questions saying, have I done five? Have I done five? So would it help? And it, that won't interrupt them, will it? If you're counting the five seconds on each side. Yeah. So if, if, um, if, if you learn to guide that, that would be best because especially for beginners, um, I mean, eventually, uh, after term or so after a few weeks you'll be able to go box breathing and they might they'll you'll give them the tool by doing it so i mean that's probably a wonderful way to do it but definitely guided to begin with because their minds will wander so much but children are different to adults in the fact that they are more inherently in the present moment so um guiding it simply but definitely definitely being present with them in the exercise yeah thank you aaron that's really good I, i'm gonna try that tomorrow. yeah um, it's actually one of the videos that I'm, uh, I'm doing on this series, which is coming out. One of them is a guided box breathing session, but that's 10 minutes. So that might be too much of a lesson time. I'll make a smaller one as well. Um, yeah, and also we can chat and I could talk through some things with guiding meditations. Brilliant. Thank you. You're welcome. So, um, meditation, uh, is very difficult. <laughs> um, the it's it's a little bit like what i said earlier about mindfulness in that meditation is the practice um you are not meditating if you are thoughtless you are meditating by getting distracted and coming back to the object of focus so it definitely is down to practice in the fact that your meditation becomes less distracted after practice um but you are doing it right if you're getting distracted you you're doing it perfectly the it's it's a simple method of get distracted realize you're distracted come back to the object of focus whatever you are deciding is your object of focus so meditation isn't difficult in that sense in the fact that it's a very simple method it's just um annoying it's frankly annoying at the beginning when your mind is just chatting 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 um how how long can you meditate for after three years? Um, I, I sit for quite a long time. Um, I've done three, four, five hour sittings. Um, I'm currently embarking on a 10 day silent solitary retreat where I'll be meditating almost all day. <laughs> 
um, but this is my passion and and um, I'm really out there to study the mind and understand the concept of self. Um, so this, it, an athlete would go running, um, I'm meditating. So if we're looking at this from a situation of someone who wants to gain uh, some autonomy and some um, distance from their thoughts and emotion, I think that um, you, you want to aim low and build consistency is actually what you should be thinking about. So start with three minutes and eventually building up to, on average, from my experience and from my teacher's teachings, 20 minutes um, is a great thing, a goal to aim for because the mind will, you will be able often, unless it's a particularly hectic day, still the mind somewhat within 20 minutes. But aim low. This isn't like a sport where aim, aim high all the time. Aim low, build consistently, consistency and build it up. Thank you, Aaron, for that. It's just that a minute, I can do it for about a minute. <laughs> so I think I need to build on that. It's just, it's just getting so used to it. It's that, it's that distraction and, and maybe, I don't know, it might be you, you kind of give up. So it's, it's right. to continue with it, is it? Yeah, I mean, set a timer and just say, I'm not getting up until that timer goes off is, is the key. And eventually, eventually, when the thought comes up of, oh, I'll go make a cup of tea, yeah. You'll, you'll gain enough distance. Eventually you will gain enough distance for that thought to not become a compulsive behavior. It will become a thought that you will be able to watch and then let it fall away and you maintain yeah. something. So yeah. through practice, you will, um, yeah, you will gain autonomy over these compulsive, that's restlessness. It's a very common, common thing. <laughs> very common. Um, okay. So I'll set a timer and I'm aiming for 20 minutes. Yeah, and also guided meditations are very key if you're a, if you're a beginner because it helps your mind, it helps bring you back. So there's, there's, lo there's loads of apps like Calm and YouTube and um, Headspace, which will help you with that. Um, and also, if you want to just do it on a timer, there's Insight Timer, which is a gong rather than the iPhone. It's a bit more zen. Um, but guided meditation, I would really recommend short guided meditations to start with. That's great. Thank you. You're welcome. And mindfulness be used as a tool to improve self-esteem. If so, how can we develop this in primary age children? This is a huge, um, thing that I've been um, learning about recently, um, especially around the topic of failure and rejection. Um, uh, how long have we got? Got a little bit. Um, quick story. Uh, a woman goes through an awful divorce um, and she just put off dating for ages. After 20 years, she decides that she's ready to date again. Uh, she goes on an online dating site. The man turns up. He's handsome. Uh, the chat seems to be going well. But halfway through the date, he stands up and he just thinks, he just says, I don't think this is going anywhere. I'm, I'm going to leave now. After the woman uh, putting so much um, hope into this date and sort of feeling so rejected, she's almost crippled by, by the rejection. She picks up the phone. And all she can do is pick up the phone and call her friend. And her friend just says, well, what do you expect? You've been single for so long that you've got fat. You said that thing that was just stupid. I don't know why you said that. Who's going to find you attractive if you say that sort of stuff? And some of you might find this surprising that her friend said this to her. It's cruel, right? But I don't think you would find it as surprising if I told you that that was actually what she said to herself in her head after the rejection and the failure. And this is such a common thing that humans go through a, a psychological or an emotional trauma through failure or rejection and they deepen the wound. They like, deepen it like if we got a physical cut on our hand we wouldn't grab a knife and try and deepen it but we do do that psychologically for some reason often so the way that mindfulness can occur here is you gain that distance you hear those thoughts you aren't those thoughts you are someone who has self-worth and these are thoughts trying to tell you otherwise but they can come and go you don't have to indulge in yourself and identify with those thoughts so mindfulness implies that you are watching something other than yourself 
this is quite a core um, teaching in, in Buddhism and yoga, but isn't often thought about in our society that we aren't our thoughts. And it is a fact we are not our thoughts. They are a facet of our internal environment. Um, so cultivating distance is how I think um, that can be helped. And then with primary age children, I can't go into specifics. I'm not sure with children, but I hope that that, that helps conceptualize how it could be so protecting people's self-esteem. Um, when people go through failure and rejection to gain the habit of supporting themselves as if they were a good friend, that's okay. This was hard, this was failure. How can I learn in a constructive manner and how can I move forward and, and spend time with loved ones? Um, that's how I have to say on that. I'm afraid I'm, I'm not educated enough or qualified to say, particularly with children. I hope that was valuable. Um, looking forward to your future clips. Any basic books you would recommend for mindfulness background information? One of the books that really, um, oh, books for mindfulness. The only, oh, I've had most of my education through Buddhism. We're, and Buddhists are very, uh, it's, it's, it's an ancient practice of mindfulness a very easy to understand. So, so I, I'm, I'm, te I'm like being tentative not to like, like shove a religion down someone's throat, but it is a very rational method. Buddhism doesn't have to be a religion. It can just be a Buddhist method towards mindfulness. So, um, um, why ugh, this sounds like it's really shoving religion uh, down someone's throat, but why Buddhism is true is quite a good book, which just talks about the rational arguments behind the Buddhist practice. Um, that was one of the things that got me first interested before I had any form of faith or anything in the practice. Um, but um, I'll look for some resources and I'll um, put them out with, with these videos because I think that's actually a, a very key thing. So thank you for your question. Thoughts about meditating to music. <clears throat> the thing that makes meditation unique is the fact that you are internalizing your attention. You are turning your attention internally. Everything throughout the day is requiring our attention to be in the exterior world. And I think the most value from meditation is that shk. Music can be relaxing and it can help calm the nervous system. And if it's subtle music, you definitely can still maintain a sense of introspection um, with it. Um, but what you're really trying to do in meditate, this is my own personal view. So many people meditate with music and I think it's a very, um, meditating on the music and meditating how the music makes you feel is, is a, I think probably a beautiful practice, but I'm quite a purist in what I believe meditation is. And I believe that it is time to listen to thought, emotion, physical sensation, perception, judgment, all these internal, processes and if you're trying to listen to a lecture playing music at the same time is, might cause a cacophony meaning that you might not be able to listen to the lecture as well is what i would say so my own personal opinion would be meditating on music is probably a beautiful practice to be able to understand the artist and the music and get to know how you feel with your music but if you really want to study your thoughts and emotions and gain some more perspective on them. I would recommend simplifying, simplifying your environment totally. Quiet, eyes closed, or if you're tired, eyes open with a simple landscape, like a, a wall or a floor. If you're tired, it helps to have your eyes open sometimes. That's my thoughts on meditating to music.
Thank you for your question. And that looks like the last question that's come in as well. Um, if no one else has got any questions that they want to add or any final thoughts, um, I think that's a really good place to, to leave tonight. Alan, thank you so much for your time and everyone that's, that's joined us tonight. I hope that you've, you've enjoyed it and you've, you've taken something from tonight that you can either um, research more, um, contemplate further or look to then put into practice. Um, but thank you all for your attendance and Aaron for being our expert for the night. <laughs> I know you hate it. And I just thank you both as well. Thanks, Melissa, and thanks, Aaron. I hope you all found that as inspiring as, as I did. Um, really fantastic and uh, something that, uh, you know, whilst I don't practice it, um, and I should be more undoubtedly, and I can see my wife there laughing, um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but it's something I, I'm, I'm pretty passionate about, and obviously as a scientist as well as a biologist, um, and, and something actually in our last school that we drove, uh, my last school we drove through massively, uh, mindfulness programme, something we're really keen on here, particularly in obviously what is a difficult time for everybody and, and the whole community. Uh, and I thought, um, you know, what you had to say, Aaron, um, you know, I'm sure has inspired everybody uh, on this screen tonight. And, uh, and I think everybody will be looking forward to your uh, forthcoming videos uh, and the whole series you're going to run on well-being for us. So thank you so much. It's great to see everyone around the screen. Thank you to everybody who has joined us tonight. So many people here, OW staff, pupils, uh, etc. Thanks so much, everybody, for your time. Please take care. Stay safe. Stay well. Thank you. Bye, thank everybody. You. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Good night. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you.